Good evening all, and welcome. What's so scary about a piece of wood? And a little planchette? Nothing really. Right? Wrong. Some seriously spooky things have happened with those who mess with a Ouija board. As you're about to find out, so believe me or not, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. About two years ago, my Nana bought home a Ouija board that she found at a yard sale. I've always been a true believer in the paranormal, and it's always been one of my peak interests. I've heard and read enough stories and watched enough shows to know not to mess around with a Ouija board. And quite frankly, they sort of freaked me out. So I wanted nothing to do with it. My Nana, on the other hand, doesn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever and thought it would be a fun game for myself, my brother, and the oldest of my two cousins. I left it on the dining room table for days before she made me put it away. I ended up sliding it under my bed in the hopes of just forgetting about it. My brother of 11 and my cousin of 12 bugged me about it constantly because they wanted to play with it and I wouldn't let them. I tried to explain it to them that it wasn't just a game and that it shouldn't be messed with, but they were preteen boys who couldn't help but do things they shouldn't. One day after I got home from work, the boys were there and I had this sneaking suspicion they played with it. I looked under my bed and it was there, but I had this odd feeling. And when I went downstairs and interrogated them about it, at first they denied it. But I saw right through them and they finally admitted that they had played with it. I asked them if they had said goodbye when they were done, and they said they did. My cousin likes to over-exaggerate stories big time and make up details to be overly dramatic. So when he told me about a couple of things that supposedly happened, I didn't believe him at all. Also, they were boys who liked to mess with each other. So I assumed that that was happening now. A couple of nights later, I got into bed, and as I lay there trying to fall asleep, I get this feeling like I'm being watched. I look over at my closet that has two large sliding doors, and I notice that one of the doors is slightly ajar, which left a small space between the doors. It creeped me out for some reason, so I turned and faced the other way, trying to ignore everything and fall asleep. I finally fell asleep, and the next thing I know I'm woken up by what felt like someone or something hitting me in the back of the head. I was laying on my back, so the back of my head was fully on my pillow, which made it even weirder. And it wasn't a light hit either. It freaked me out so much, I was shaking. I look around my room and don't see anything, but then, all of a sudden, I hear my floor creaking like someone is walking around my bed. I'm so freaked out at this point it wasn't funny. After laying there a good little while, I finally got the courage to get up and grab my phone and book it to my living room. I sat down and tried to calm, but I still could feel a tingling pulsing sensation on the back of my head. I turned on my phone and realized it was three in the morning. I called my boyfriend, now husband, with tears streaming down my face from being so freaked out. He didn't pick up, and I swear I called him another 15 to 20 times before I finally gave up. I sat in the chair until my Nana got up around six. I didn't tell her what happened, because I knew she wouldn't believe me and say that I was acting dumb. After she got up, I had breakfast, and called my boyfriend again and he finally answered. He told me he had his phone on silent, so he didn't know that I had been calling. I gave him so much crap for this and told him what happened, and he felt so bad and like an idiot for having his phone on silent. He told me he would have come over in a heartbeat to comfort me and was so apologetic. Later that day, he never came over and we took the Ouija board to a junkyard to get rid of it. My husband is the only one in my family that knows what happened and I didn't experience anything after I got rid of it. Moral of the story, 
Ouija boards shouldn't be messed with. Back in the 80s, I was in college and lived in a dorm room. I never owned a Ouija board, but if someone had one, then I'd either watch or participate. To be honest, this was one of the first times I ever used it. I had a question for the board. My grandmother had my father when she was young and single. That was a big deal back in the 1930s. When she found out she was pregnant, she ran away from home, dropped my father off at her parents' house when he was six months old and left, coming to visit less and less frequently. By the time he was five, she'd never come back at all and vanished. So my father was raised by an aunt, never really knew his mother and didn't have any idea who his father was. By the time he was in his forties, he wanted to find her. Lots of dead ends, but he eventually did. Anyway, that night I asked the board if my grandmother was alive. The board said yes, and I asked if she lived in my home state. The board said yes. I asked if she lived in my hometown. The board said yes. I asked what street she lived on, and the board spelled out the name of the street, Washington Street. At the time, I wasn't sure if there was a Washington Street in my hometown, but it turns out there was. No, grandma didn't live there, but two years later, my father found his mum. She lived in my home state in the town of Washington. It wasn't the street's name, it was the town's name. How messed up is that? More than 30 years later, I still have no explanation. I am the youngest of four brothers, all a year apart. At this time, I was about nine and our family friend was spending the night at our place. We lived in a two story house with a basement. At this time, my mother was single and dating a lot. So during this particular night, she was away. We saw how to make a Ouija board on this episode of a show called Mystery Hunters, a Canadian kids channel, YTV. So we decided it would be a fun thing to try while we had the house to ourselves. So we cut up an old cardboard box and made a Ouija board from it. We put felt on the bottom of the triangle thing so that it would slide better and it worked pretty well. We all tried putting our fingers on the triangle and asking questions, but got no response. Then me and my brother asked a question to the likes of, is there a demon here? And the triangle started to move. We looked at each other and the expression on our faces showed that it was neither of us moving the triangle. We immediately got scared and ran into the kitchen. When we got there, we heard a crash come from the living room. It sounded like our TV fell off the wall unit. But when we ran back, we saw that nothing was wrong. After this, we decided to grab a Bible and read. The first words we read in unison were, God's people are doomed. Frightened by this, we turned on the TV and saw it was Dave Chappelle, so we assumed it was gonna be something funny. But when the audio began, the first words from Dave were, and all the people died to which the audience started laughing, and then it went to a commercial. Freaked out by both of these strange and unlikely things happening, the waterworks began, and we got up and ran upstairs crying and screaming to my brother's bedroom. When we got up the stairs and into his bedroom, we heard footsteps that sounded exactly like ours run up the stairs after us. Immediately, I assumed it was one of my brothers or our friends late up the stairs. But then we realized we were all in the room and no one passed by the door. We began to panic. So we held each other freaking out. It's hard to say if we heard anything after this point. So this was the last that happened for now. Two hours later, me and my brother, the bravest of the four, decided that this might be all in our heads and that we would go play video games on my mom's computer in her office, Diablo 2 to be exact. The door to her office had no handle, so my brother pushed the door open, and immediately after he pushed the door, it slammed back on his arm, and all the way from the basement, we heard clear and loud laughter. The only way I can describe it 
as it was the sound of a witch that echoed through the entire house. At this point, we ran down the stairs, out the door into my grandmother's house, which was down the street and waited for mum to come home. I'm not sure if she completely believed us, but this was when we were kids. I'm 23 years old now, and this story sticks out as the only and craziest paranormal experience I have ever had. In 1979, when my mother was 15, a large group of my extended family were gathered in my grandmother's house in rural Iowa, where most of them live. They were there to discuss what was to be done with my recently deceased great grandmother's house. You see, my great grandmother had hated the house, and so in the final six months of her life, had built another house on the same plot of land, which I guess wasn't in accordance with state zoning laws. As any logical thinker would do, they decided to ask my great grandmother herself. Ouija board in hand, the female members in the family walk out into the night to do their seance at her house, which was just down the dirt road from where they were. The house was built in the mid 19th century, had six bedrooms, was huge, and from what I can gather, didn't have any electricity. So they brought candles to light the space. About half the women in attendance were believers, with the others being skeptics, which led to some frustration with them asking questions on the Ouija board. However, sometime in the night, the energy of the house totally changed. One of my aunts asked if Margaret was there, but got no response from the board. Instead, a piece of tinsel on the doorway began to swing like a pendulum. My mum's youngest brother had just celebrated his birthday there a few weeks earlier, and the decorations were still up. It would be easy to say that the wind or atmospheric pressure could have accounted for this. However, keep in mind it was in a large house and the rooms surrounding the central living room acted as a wind block. It is also worthwhile to point out that the candles at no point flickered nor went out. The movement continued with every question, back and forth like a pendulum. Finally, someone asks what was going to be done with the house and the tinsel stopped moving altogether and began to violently move in the opposite direction. The tinsel stopped responding after the question. So they moved back to the Ouija board and no sooner had they done it, did it spell out a very simple six letter message. Burn it. They hauled ass back home, called the volunteer fire department and did just that. For years now, I've been interested in the paranormal. I would do investigations with friends for years and even helped out a paranormal group from time to time. But my best encounter was when I was in the military. I was stationed at one of the army bases in the States and wouldn't have lots to do on the weekends. So one day I was really bored and brought myself a Ouija board, which was a big mistake, but I was a skeptic and needed to know. So I would do it with friends mainly and nothing major happened except we would have the mover go by quickly. Several times we got responses, but the red flag should have been there when we got the response from Zozo and Mama. But then I started seeing stuff. The first time was when we used it in the center for events and volunteering. Nothing major happened, but then one night while volunteering, I went to sit in the giant room for conferences just to think. The middle lights were on, and the front and back ones were off and I was just sitting in the back. At some point, this man suddenly walks from one side of the front of the room to the middle front. I was about to ask if he was there for volunteering, but then I realized that he came from where there was no door. Then it looked at me in the eyes and there was a shine in it like an animal's eyes. And I just took off and ran. I went back in a little while later but there was no one there. You would think I would stop using the board, right? No, I used it in my room with a friend one time. And afterwards, one night while sleeping, I opened my eyes and looked at a silhouette of a man standing at the far corner of my room. It then started walking towards me. And as I began shaking my head, it was gone. The next night I put a movie on in my portable DVD player and I slept, no encounter. After a while, I turned my player off to sleep. That night I woke up again, 
when a young woman's figure was right near me by my bed. She began to reach for me and I shook my head and she too was gone. The remaining nights in that barrack, I kept that thing playing. Before I left the military, a few friends and I used the board one last time in another hangout place that was said to be haunted. Nothing happened to us, but a friend who was also a volunteer in the hallway said that she heard three loud hissing sounds and three laughters in her ear. She never went back there. Since my experience, I haven't touched a Ouija board since, though it's still in the box of my room. Some part of me wants to throw it out, but I've heard stories of people burning it or throwing it out for its return. Since then, I haven't had a true experience, but I do have that player playing every day while I sleep. For those of you wanting to play the Ouija board, do realize when you play it, you're going to be opening a door to something you don't know or couldn't possibly understand. I got lucky. All my life, I've been told I'm special and that I have abilities and to trust my intuition. I always have, and there have been many times where I've encountered supernatural entities. As a toddler, when I would be at my grandparents, I'd spend hours in my grandparents' bedroom in the corner, looking at the window and talking to my deceased great grandfather, Jack. I don't recall what I would talk to him about, but this did scare my family quite a bit, as I knew things from my conversations with him about my family that happened before I was born. This went on for years every time I was at my grandparents' house. When I was around 10, I got up in the middle of the night near Christmas Eve to go to the restroom, and halfway there, something caught my eye. I saw the black silhouette of something, or someone, hiding behind the archway. I could see a big beard, and it was taking deep breaths, slowly. I thought it was my father and said, nice try, I see you. But there was no response, just the slow, deep and constant breathing from this dark figure with a large beard. I started to feel an overwhelming sense of dread that made me feel sick, and I dropped to my knees. Whatever this thing was, it looked malicious, and the energy from it was affecting me physically. I looked back up to confront it, but it was gone. It had vanished, but I was still very physically sick for the next few hours, as its residual energy remained. Sometime later, when I'm 18, I'm in my bedroom, AC off, windows closed. It was a still night, and there was no drafts in my room. I was browsing the internet on my iBook, and all of a sudden, I had this pain in my head. It felt as if I'd been hit by something at the back of my head and started to make me feel the same type of dread that I felt when I saw and felt the entity when I was 10 and also made me feel like I was being watched. I began to look around my room to see if there was anything in it. I couldn't see anything like I did when I was 10, but I could feel it. The level of dread I felt was no way near as intense as when I was 10, and it didn't make me feel weak and physically sick, but it did make me feel ill. I then saw the dream catcher hanging over my window start to move. It moved slowly and gently at first, but then it became faster and more violent. It built up speed, moving back and forth over a few minutes, until it was being so violently moved that it ripped off the wall above the window and flew across the room. After this, the feeling quickly lifted and I assumed the entity had left. In my early 20s, I encountered the most malicious entity I'd ever felt. I'd moved into a new house, freshly built, and at first, things would be out of place or moved, and I just thought it was me, as I've always been a scatterbrain. The first time I saw it, I was in my ensuite, and I got the most intense chill down my spine and every single hair on my body stood on end. I didn't feel dread this time. I felt what I can only call pure hatred and rage. There aren't quite words to describe it, but that's as close as I can put into words. That's when I saw it, in the ensuite mirror, that just outside the door, there was the darkest silhouette I've ever seen. It was darker than the darkest night, 
and it wasn't in an unlit hall. All the lights were on, but it was as if it was absorbing all the light coming near it. I could also see black, tiny orbs floating around it. Due to the rage and fear I was feeling from it, I wasn't scared or sick. I was furious, screaming at it. What do you want? What are you? I picked up a bottle of aftershave and threw it at the entity. It went through it and shattered the mirror behind it as it faded away. Not instantly disappearing in the blink of an eye like my previous experience. No. It just slowly dissipated into nothing. Over the next two years, I continued to randomly see this entity. There'd be months between sightings at least. I'd always see it in only two areas of the house, the kitchen and the ensuite. I'd always feel these feelings of hatred and rage every time, and the chills down my spine would become more intense. I could feel this thing wanting me dead. I tried to communicate with it, but it never would respond or show any sign of wanting to communicate. I'm a pagan, so I tried some rituals to no avail, and as a last resort, I decided to try a spirit board. I performed the protection circle ritual and wore protective crystals and started at 3 a.m. I lit six candles in a circle around me and asked for any spirits with me to speak up through the spirit board. And the planchette started to move. W E C U. The chill returned and all my hair stood on end. After I read that, I was terrified. I looked up and was in shock and couldn't move a muscle. It wasn't just the one pure black entity. There were six of them, side by side watching me. I opened my mouth to ask what they wanted, but before I could make any words out, the candles blew out and the salt protection circle was blown away in a gust of air breaking it and I was violently pulled by my feet and dragged out the circle while screaming in terror. The entities weren't touching me, they were watching me. Nothing visible was pulling me. I was dragged out my lounge room and towards the garage. And as I was pulled through the garage internal door, I smacked my head on the concrete floor and passed out. When I came to, my head was pounding and my head was bleeding severely. I remember what happened and my flight response kicked in and I got up and ran as fast as I could to the front door. I ripped the door open and got into the car that was on the street and started it before I put it in gear. I looked back and the figures were watching me from the front bedroom window. I put the car in gear and floored it. I never returned and had movers move everything to a new home. The entities didn't follow. There is a spirit in my new home though, but I believe it's my great grandfather. And every now and then I smell the strongest cigarette smoke and I feel loved. I believe he's watching over me in my new house and I've never experienced anything that's so malicious and plain evil like I did with those six entities. And I knew they wanted me gone, but why? I'll never know, not that I wish to know. This story takes place in a cabin in Vermont. It was a small room with a lofted area for the bed, a wood stove for heat and no running water, attached with a composting toilet pretty far away, nestled into the mountainside on a dirt road, off another dirt road, both formerly logging trails. My girlfriend found the place on Craigslist and wanted to move into it together because in lieu of rent, we could provide eight hours of labor a week to the landlord. I like adventure and the wild setting, and I was nervous that if she went in without me, she would be in over her head. The backstory on the cabin is that it was built by a man with the initials DC in the mid seventies. He suffered from schizophrenia and lived in the cabin while renting out another on the property for income. Somewhere along the line, he had a couple in his rental property who couldn't pay the rent and wouldn't move out, and that upset him. While they were gone, he burnt their home, which he owned to the ground. In the fallout, their relationship ended, 
and they drifted away. DC built another cabin, a shack really, two small rooms with a low ceiling, adjacent to the rubble and moved in. I assume that was so that he could rent out his larger cabin. But no one I spoke to about it could confirm that. Most of the history comes from our landlord who briefly knew DC, and a college friend of his who still lives on the mountain in a shack made of plastic and tarps with a propane cooking stove for heat. He is a lovely guy and a beautiful artist who doesn't like talking to strangers. But he and I connected over our love of nature and the pursuit of freedom. The shack still stands on the property but the roof is full of holes and is terribly rotten. It is frankly questionable how a structure as unsound as it is stays up, but it does. The shack overlooks the cabin and can be seen looking out from the bathroom window and the southwest window in the main cabin. It was unearthly to see it in the moonlight. The story I'm about to share took place on November 18th of last year, roughly two weeks after my girlfriend and I moved in. Kaylee had some problems and still does. I loved her dearly, though at this point in time, we were inseparable. The day starts normally. She went to work, I stayed home and gave the dog a bath. A statty stopped by looking for her, second time she was out, and delivered a card. I texted her a photo and told her to get in touch without thinking, and that set her off. I had to go to work, so I sent her a message that I said I trusted her and would see her later. I went to work with the landlord, I mean old POS, one of the bad yogi variety, and left my phone and my coat. We were bucking logs and splitting wood that day, which is warm work as the old saying goes. So I tossed my coat on the side and didn't hear my phone ring. When we were done splitting wood, he needed me to help him drop off a car for his repair as he needed my help because he has no friends and the place we were going to was some rando rustic shop because he thought he could make the guy work for extra cheap. On the way back, I finally take a look at my phone and there's the one message you never ever want to see. The note that says you'll lend your life. We get back to the mountain and I'm at a loss. My car has been sitting there since the day I bought it over because the battery is dead and it has no gas in it because I forgot my wallet the last time I drove it. And her car is a reliable one. And wherever she is, she isn't answering her phone. I tried calling her relatives to no avail. So I mentioned the predicament to my landlord and he cracks a joke that she's probably already deceased before covering up with a very hollow, it's usually nothing. He says I can have a half gallon of gas from the can and he'll give me a jump, but that's it. I honestly didn't care because it was enough to get me moving and I was in no mood to be wasting energy. So I set out, jumper cables in the passenger seat, three bucks in my pocket for gas, which was literally all I had at that point, because you don't work for rent if you're flush with cash. And I white knuckled it to town, praying with my whole soul that she would be all right. I drove to all our usual spots with no luck and went to the bar where her sister works in the hope of finding her. She wasn't working. So I gave the bartender my number and asked him to reach out to her saying that it was urgent. Then I went to Kaylee's work, which was babysitting and asked how she was when she left. Her employer told me she had left bitterly, swearing that she was going to end her life. But she hadn't done anything because she didn't think it was important. Just think about that for a moment. Then a glimmer of hope. Her sister has a heads up, a single text message of the letter S. But after roughly five hours up against it, we knew she was still breathing and you can't imagine my relief. So I went home and waited and kept texting her encouragement. Night fell and I was in the cabin alone, waiting. I'm a little bit of a poet and so I finally sent this poem. Sweet baby girl out on your own, who knows the way that will guide you back home. We love you, we miss you, our beating hearts, have flown out from our chests to seek our missing one. She came home a half hour later, 
staggered through the door and fell into my arms sobbing. She said that she had stopped three times on her way up to the mountain because she lacked the strength to return, but she said I had called her back. I asked her how she was and she said that she felt heavy and cold, like she'd fallen down a dark hole. She said she couldn't find her way out and that she had lost the light. I specifically remember her saying she felt like something was trying to swallow her and wouldn't let her go. Then she looked at me and said she thought something from the cabin or the mountain was attacking her through her Ouija board. At this point, I felt thoroughly up against it. Her Ouija board is over a 100 years old, one of the original boards made from a single piece of wood. I had seen it once or twice but didn't like it much because of my background. I'm Christian and strongly believe in the existence of demons and spirits and the like. And depending on who you ask, a Ouija board is like a direct door to hell. Her board is stored in a closet under the cabin, reachable only by a steep dirt path tucked in any one of a random assortment of boxes. The last time Kaylee had been down there, she very nearly fell on a pair of scissors. To put it bluntly, there were very bad vibes and they were strong. So I told her I would deal with it if she agreed to follow my instructions until we were done. She was nearly dead on her feet and agreed. The first thing I did was to climb to the loft and get my crucifix. It was a gift to me from a man I met walking my dog, passed down to him from his German grandmother who had it blessed by a Catholic priest. I have another story about the crucifix, but that's not for today. I sit her on the couch and hand it to her with the order to hold it in front of her and to not say anything. My father is a pastor and my mother a devout, so I called them. I told my mother what the situation was and she says, you can't exercise a board because it's inherently evil. To which I replied, I know, but I can drive away anything coming through it and bind its power. I asked her to pray for my protection and success and she said she would. I cleared my desk so I had a place to put the board on when I got back. I laid my Bible on it to be ready at hand and put my coat on and looked at the front door. I didn't want to go out. I can't tell you how much I did not want to leave. The board made me uncomfortable on a good day. Now I had to go find it in a closet in the dark by myself with the full knowledge that it was harming my girlfriend. I put on the only headlamp we had, mustered my courage and stepped out. It was dark. There was a slight breeze and the area felt heavy. Imagine the feeling of resistance of walking in a heavy wind, but without the wind to justify the resistance. I shuffled down to the embankment to the closet, took a deep, deep breath and opened the door. The lamp only lit half the space and I didn't enjoy that. Fortunately for me, the board was in the first box I opened. We kept it wrapped in a purple alpaca wool shawl with moons and stars on it that I got from the man that gave me the crucifix with the intention of keeping it both tucked away and relatively place sated. The shawl was super soft and the board said it should be cleaned with a silk cloth before use. Unfortunately for me, the shawl was half unwrapped and the naked board was hanging out in the cold. I picked it up by the covered part and wrapped it up. I took one step and something happened. I say something because it felt like I stumbled, but I didn't. I was anticipating everything and didn't want to drop the board or anything. So I was moving slowly and deliberately, but I put my foot down and braced myself from falling over. The second step was the same. I can't really describe it because I didn't feel a hand or a shove and my feet didn't slip or slide, but my balance was all over. I carefully climbed up the embankment and went back in and set the board in the spot I had made for it. I unwrapped it, placed my Bible directly between me and it, sat down, put my hands flat on my desk and went for it. I tried to cast out the evil and bind the board with the most powerful, clear and distinct language I could. As soon as I was done speaking, the heavy feeling that had been lingering vanished. I wrapped up the board and asked Kaylee if it worked. She smiled and nodded, closed her eyes and said that she could feel the light again and the feeling of being trapped was gone. 
Now there's one last wrinkle I want to leave you with, and I swear to you, it's true. The night before it all happened, I had a dream. In that dream, I ran onto a pier through the ocean, through a fence, and the wind and waves were crashing to get to Kaylee, and I carried her back as the storm winds howled and tried to throw us into the sea. When we made land and took shelter, I opened a door into a pillar and thrust her in ahead of me. Then I went in and found the room full of people in historical garb, some 1920s, some earlier. There were about 13, but this was a dream. I do remember clearly a little boy, newsy style, with thick blood coming down from his upper cap and a very haunting look in his eyes. I opened the door and pulled us both out of the room. And that moment was when I woke up. My name is Joseph, and I used to live in Folsom, California, the old part. My neighborhood friends were Rob, Kristen and Robin. I'm on Natoma Street, and they were down at Sibley, Figuera and Reading Street. Folsom's been around for ages, used to be a mining town, gold coming down from Placer, El Dorado and Amador. It would pass through on its way to San Francisco. So there are a lot of old churches and cemeteries on this side of town. And it's not uncommon to find bones while digging in your yard. Rob lived on Sibley and I on Natoma. And where these streets met are churches and cemeteries. Oh, and a small park in front of his house where we'd kick it. At the time, Rob was dating Kristen, and I had an eye for her friend Robin, which never panned out. But we still hung out as friends, and this is what happened to us one night while hanging out in a graveyard. We walked down Natoma and crossed Folsom Boulevard to hang out in the cemetery where Rob had seen a tombstone with a motorcycle engraving, and had the most wonderful idea to whip out a Ouija board and try to speak with the guy. I always thought these things were nonsense. It says Parker Bros on the box, so to me, it's about as scary as playing Monopoly. That night, the weather wasn't great, but not too bad, cloudy with a breeze, and it took forever to get the candles lit. We all had to open our jackets and huddle up to prevent the wind from blowing out the lighter. So it's set up on the guy's tombstone, candles for effect, and we begin. Stupid questions, giggles, the Hey, I know you guys are moving it. Nobody was taking this seriously. Until the weirdness started. First, the wind picks up and the candles don't go out. Easy enough, trick candles. The ones for birthday cakes that are hard to blow out. But these weren't those. Then the rain begins to drizzle. The board isn't really getting wet, but it is coated in wax, right? No, I don't think that was the reason. I mean, raindrops didn't land on the board at all. We started getting pelted by rain, the board and candles remained as they were. I wish that was the end of it. I was scared, as were the girls, but Rob couldn't be more excited. Then someone says, what's that? There are lights at the cemetery, kind of like street lights along the fence and driveway. And we could see something moving about 50 to 60 yards away, a silhouette a shadow moving from tree to tree, getting closer. It moved really fast. At about 30 yards, it passed under a streetlight, and we could see it was just a blob of black, and we all ran. Rob's fastest, and I'm behind the girls, keeping that thing over my shoulder following the star on Rob's starter jacket. When running in the dark in between tombstones and trees, making our way to the front gate, when I felt something grab my leg, it was the chain that ran along the top of the posts at the driveway, but I thought it had me when I looked front to see where I was going. I broke the chain and wrapped around my leg. I ran across Folsom Boulevard with one of the posts still attached, and when I stopped to pull it off, I realized that I had wet myself. I don't remember if we met up in the park or if we just ran all the way home, but I'm glad that that thing didn't cross the street. I'm sure for them, that was that, but it didn't end for me. I ruined a pair of jeans that I'd have to explain. I had a deep bruise around my throat I'd have to explain, but what I couldn't explain was the damn Ouija board in my room. We ran. 
I didn't go back for it, and neither did they. But I'm crapping myself because it's sitting on my bed. I'd rather get caught with a dime bag or a dirty magazine than this. This is totally forbidden in my house, and now I had to hide it until garbage day. I took all the garbage bags out of the can and put it on the bottom and stacked the bags on top. Job done. Nope. At some point, it's back in my room. We had a cord of firewood on the side of the house, so I wedged it in tight and stacked logs on it, totally hidden till garbage day, and managed to get it out the can before anyone could notice. But then it was back again. At this point, I'm terrified. I threw it in a field, hid it in a friend's house to no avail. My last attempt to get rid of it worked. I took my nan's rosary and a few things precious to me, but worth it, buried it in the graveyard of the old church downtown and said out loud, this is holy ground and if anyone can hear me, please keep this thing away from me. I don't know if it stayed put, but it never came back to me. I'm still fearful of these things. When I'm watching paranormal TV shows, I'll fast forward or skip an episode because I don't even want the image on my TV. Since then, I've seen stuff that will make your hair fall out and fracture your sense of self, or maybe just break your soul. But perhaps it's only me. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories. Um, haven't done Ouija stories in a while. We don't do them that frequently to be fair. But it was Obscure Topic Wednesday, which is something I made up just now. So I hope you appreciated uh, the fun little topics. I think we probably will do all of them eventually. They are quite fun. Bus ones we do do a bit more regularly, but pizza delivery, I'm sure we haven't done that in over two years, if not three years. In fact, I'm more confident it's, it's three years. Yeah, probably three years. It's been a while, long overdue. But I've freshly got, I mean, I've just got some fresh stories that I'm sure will keep you entertained. So wait and see. All right then, guys, I'm gonna leave you there. As always, a huge thanks to my lovely and amazing patrons whose names you can see on screen. If you would like to donate every month a little bit of money to help keep the channel running, you can do that, link in the description, and you get some cool prizes for doing so. All right then, guys, for now, I'm gonna go. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.